Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Numbers. This is a show where we dig deeper to understand what matters most in business. My name is Dave Bookbinder. I'm a Senior Director of Valuation Services at CFGI, where I help my clients in the valuation of their business and intellectual property assets. Today, we're going to be talking a combination of brand and legal, and we're talking brand development and the protection of that brand with my guest today, Sean McConnell, who's a senior attorney at Pepper Hamilton. Sean, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Dave, thanks for joining, uh, for inviting me. I appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, the, I'm excited about it. The brand aspect of things has always been a, um, a big part of, of what brought me into the legal field. So. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Tell the audience a little bit about who you are and your firm, and then we'll jump in. Uh, my name is Sean McConnell, obviously. I am uh, I'm an attorney with the Intellectual Property Department at Pepper Hamilton. Um, we, Pepper Hamilton is a full service legal firm um, and we, uh, we're based in Philly, but we've got offices all over the place. Great. So let's, let's start by the, the types of companies that you work with. I know you work with both large companies and small companies, right? Yes. Okay. So when we talk about brand and brand development and protecting the IP around the brand, what are some of the similarities with, with regard to whether you're large or small, without well, regard to that? Well, a brand for whether or not the company is large or small is an investment. Um, they are... They're, they're making investments into um, the marketing dollars that they spend, into the products that they're trying to support, and the ideas that they're trying to develop. So from a similarity standpoint, both large companies and small have the challenge of ensuring that what they're looking to bring to market um, is going to have a clear path forward. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Um, and they also have the challenge of getting the the value of that brand developed. They have the, the challenge of getting the idea out into the market in the first place. So um, one of the things that I think that they do, that large companies and small companies um, have a similarity in doing is, is taking time to invest in looking at what's the best idea to back. Yeah, and we're going to jump into that in a little bit, but before we do, I kind of want to chalk the field a little bit, if you will. Sure. Well, let's just talk a little bit with regard to the protection process. Yes. At, at a high level, what's involved in protecting a brand? So the first thing that um, the marketing team is probably going to do is come up with a, a variety of ideas. Um, you know, the, the product team has maybe come to them with... Uh, this is the newest product that we're going to come out with. This is the latest service. This is the latest software platform that we want to, to offer to the public, to our customers. Um, how are we going to name it? How are we going to brand it? And, you know, they drop it to the marketing team, and whether or not that's in-house, in large companies it often is, uh, and in small companies it's either the founder who's come up with the idea himself or they're reaching out to, to a branding agency of some idea. And the key here is if you're bringing your legal team in early on this, um, having, a, having your legal team work with the marketing side to make sure that the ideas um, are free and clear, that you're clearing trademarks, that you're clearing um, potential brands, that you're making sure that the avenues that you want to walk down um, are clear. And so the first process is kind of going that trademark search route. Mm -hmm. um, if if you're coming to an idea or you're coming to a product with multiple options and you're thinking you're not wed to one, you're usually in a better, you're usually in a better place because you have the ability to say, I like idea A, I like idea B, B looks like it's gonna be a harder path, let's just go with A. And that, the back and forth that you can have with your legal team and your marketing team is really what helps identify which is the better path for you to take. Okay. So you talked a little bit um, about backing the right idea. Mm -hmm. So I want you to unpack that a little bit more and talk a little bit about also how, how do brands work to stand out in a good way? The first thing that you want your brand to be is authentic. Um, I, I think that you want it to be something that's true to the the company that's backing it. Um, you want your customers to look at it and say, yeah, I get it. That's, that's coming from, you know, a brand is, is a source identifier. A trademark is a source identifier. Yeah. And customers are going to look at that brand in the marketplace almost in a vacuum 
and you want them to associate that product or that trademark with your company, with who's providing that. Yeah. Authenticity um, is, a, is a word that we hear a lot in terms in, in business, right? Because mm -hmm. authenticity is what really resonates with people, whether it's your colleagues or consumers or what right. have you. Are there any examples of authentic sounding or resonating brands that come to mind? Or how would you describe creating authenticity in your brand? Um, I think creating authenticity starts with um, you know, appreciating what the mission is behind the company. Um, are you, what's the product that you're offering? Are you, are you um, an old style manufacturing company that you've been offering products for years and years and years and years where you're building off of the history behind the company? Or are you a new tech company or are you a new software platform that you're trying to create something new in the marketplace? Create um, you know, very frequently you see a lot of these new startups and they're, I'll, I'll call it taking the Google approach. They're taking a word that's new or they're taking a spin off of a word and trying to play it in a new and a different way because they want their idea to be viewed as we're a company bringing a new concept, a new market to, to, uh, to bear. So it, it really depends on what the goal is from yeah. the company itself. A an older company, by, by contrast, um, that already has an established, call it a parent brand, wants to make sure that whatever their, their offering is going to connect back to um, what they've already established because it, it's an easier ability for them to create additional call it satellites or sub-brands off of what mm -hmm. the big parent company might be. Yeah, so as a fan of Shark Tank, I, I'm always intrigued by what the companies do and, and how they branded themselves. And mm -hmm. to your point, there's a number of them that have these interesting names that where they've created a new word. And sometimes we're sitting on the sofa and we look at each other and we think, what do these guys do? You can't tell from their name uh, what their product or service line really is. So where's the balance between sounding clever and, and hip with a, a new name, new word, and being really clear to the marketplace and what you're offering. So in the trademark world, which is what I basically live in, there are two concepts of, there's a whole continuum of how words might be described and, and a completely made up word like Google or Xerox are highly unique, very um, distinctive, and yet before the companies existed, you had no idea what they were, right? Yeah. And oftentimes, you see these startups kind of going along those routes. It's easy for Google to do it. It's easy for Xerox to do it because they've been around for forever, and so people understand who they are. As you're building out, the, the real bulk of, of the brands and the trademarks, though, fall within this realm of suggestive marks versus descriptive marks. and and you can build value around those because a concept will be suggestive of what you're doing, but it won't really, it'll give you a hint of what you might um, be offering, but not do it you know, precisely like saying, you know, um, you, can, you can use, I'll give um, a term like, let's start with Apple, a term like Apple really has no bearing on what it meant for purposes of computers. But if you start to use that term for a different brand that's closer to baking or jellies or um, food products or restaurants or some along, somewhere along those lines, you see it where it falls closer to describing what that product yeah. is. And you don't want to fall too far down that continuum because then you can't protect it. But the, the closer that you can get to being clever, we'll yeah. call it, um, is probably the sweet spot of where you want to be. And, and ultimately, as you're going through that clearance process, you know, this is that back and forth between your marketing team and, and probably your legal team to make sure that you're not going to fall too far to one side or the other. Sean, for the folks watching and listening who want to learn more about you or how they can work with you, what's the best way to reach you? Um, the best way to reach me is you know, either at uh, Pepper Hamilton's website, which is www.pepperlaw.com, or I'm on LinkedIn. That was easy. We only have a couple of minutes left in this segment, and I want to ask you something. When you talked about Xerox, it, it occurred to me that Xerox became a rather generic term for making a photocopy, in the similar way that Google has almost become a generic term for search. Um, Q-tip, Kleenex, other ubiquitous Band -Aid names. Band-Aid brand bandages. Yeah, exactly. So 
these are really well-known brands, but what happens when you reach that tipping point where they cross over to now becoming more of that generic commoditized perception? It's, it's a real challenge. Um, but it's a challenge you probably want, right? So if, if your brand is so valuable that people are using it almost as a noun, um, which is what you don't want to do, you want to be Band-Aid brand band -aid, or, uh, bandages. You want to yeah. be Coca-Cola soft drinks. You, don't wanna be a, you want to be Xerox photocopying. Um, the, the challenge is making sure that you're associating not just that word, and, and using it at times just as a single word is, is fine, but always associating it back to the product or service that you're offering. And that is a lesson that holds true, not just for big companies, but for smaller companies and startups who are trying to build off of um, what their new product or what their brand is going to be. You don't want to take steps down the road and essentially cre cause genericide to your mark yeah. right out of the gate. And you know, frequently we see a lot of companies, you know, maybe not very experienced companies, who've already done that. They'll do that in in describing it on their website, or they'll they'll use the term very descriptively um, on you know marketing materials that go out, or or in presentations to their own customers. And it, at some point in time, you lose what the brand is behind it. Yeah, I think that's a great spot to take our break here. So um, we'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit, and we'll take it as a compliment. Because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within, that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we Take charge. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. I work 13 hours a day, six days a week. So when I'm off the clock, I gotta get stuff done. So when I need a snack, I need something healthy, tasty, and easy to eat. Like wonderful pistachios without the shells. They're protein powered, delicious, and great on the go. And that's perfect for me. Thanks, Liz. A woman without a lot of time. Whether you're a gourmet cook or just want to eat like one, visit Rostelli Market Fresh, your home for the freshest locally sourced ingredients to please everyone who loves great food. Our organic meats, quality seafood, and free-range poultry are cut fresh to order. Chefs create culinary-inspired prep foods made fresh every day, which pair nicely with our vast selection of fine wines and spirits. Choose from handmade pastas, artisan cheeses, organic produce, and grocery items, all from the finest purveyors. Rostelli Market Fresh, from our family to yours. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company. Hey everybody, welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I think the camera just caught that fist bump, but that's okay, that's what we do here. Uh, we're having fun today talking about brand development protection 
with Sean McConnell, who's a senior attorney at Pepper Hamilton. And uh, in the first segment, Sean, you shared a lot of great insights, not only from a legal perspective, but from a, we'll call it a marketing and branding perspective. And I want you to explain to the audience how you're able to deliver that perspective, because you've got a pretty unique background. Um, before I went to law school, I did marketing, consulting, and branding um, back in Pittsburgh. Um, did it for a wide host uh, of companies from large real estate companies to charities to small products, um, small product manufacturers. Um, and after law school or upon entering private practice, um, I, I kind of fell into uh, an opportunity to, to do the legal side of it. And, and it got me to, f it was always a love, it's always been a, a love to see the, the creative side of marketers um, the processes that they go through, the, the behind the scene angst and back and forth, um, and the effort that they put into really creating a story behind a, a product. And so, you know, the, the chance that I have to help be a cog um, in supporting that process, um, it, it was a great opportunity when, when I ventured into private practice, and, and that's kind of what I see my, my role is now. You know, I'm, I may you know, be listening in and, and seeing where a, a marketing team might be going, and I understand their speak because I was there. Yeah. Um, and I understand the challenges that they have, um, and I understand the pressures that they're under from the top. Um, to deliver something that can actually bring value um, to the underlying bottom line. Yeah, and that's so important that you've been there and you can look at it from their lens and have that perspective. So uh, just wanted to make sure the audience understood that frame because you're adding such tremendous insight from that other side. I wanted folks to understand that. Um, can we take a dip into the wonky world of valuation? Sure. For a second here because you know, in my world we're valuing trademarks and trade names on a daily basis and they're super valuable intellectual property assets. Can you talk a little bit about whether it's large company or small company, why it's so important to develop the value of that IP and how that impacts the value of the business? So when you're talking about valuation of your IP, you're talking not just about, you're talking about a couple of things. One, you're talking about selecting the, the right mix of IP assets, right? You, you can, everybody knows in the, in the back of their mind they've got um, patents and and copyrights and perhaps they're thinking about trade secrets and perhaps they're thinking about trademarks and the the mix of those is what a company really needs to be thinking about as they're moving forward and think about your IP assets almost as as a moat around your brand as around your castle and parts of those IP assets form parts of that moat and they can form additional barriers outside of it. So as you're building out um, your, your idea or your product, you're thinking about is this product patentable? And patents are great and for a lot of types of, of um, ideas and developments, that's the right mix and whether or not that's a, a, a utility patent or whether or not that's a design patent, um, there's a lot of utility and value to that. Um, but think about whether or not that idea or that concept might be more useful to be held as a trade secret. Um, you know, the, the Colonel has done pretty good at making sure that his magic seven herbs and spices has some value to it. I mean, they, they yeah. went to painstaking processes several years ago. I don't know if you caught it in the is press. It seven or is it 11? It, it's, it's the magic seven. Okay. Um, and, or maybe it is 11 at this point, who knows. But they if went not, to there's pain, an opportunity for somebody. There you go. They went to a, a lot of process, a lot of pomp and circumstance, when they did an office change of making sure that they were showing that they were keeping that stuff secret. And there's value to that. Um, and the same thing can be said though for trademarks and brands, because while there's a life cycle um, for patents and, and they expire and go into the public domain and even for copyrights and they expire and ultimately go into the public domain albeit many 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 years from now brands can last forever um, you can have brands that if they're continually being used and they're being used in the right way and they're being um, marketed and promoted in the right way they have the ability to stay to stick in the minds of consumers you have companies that, uh, like, like General Motors and Ford, that have been around 
for eons. Even you could think of a, a name like Edison and realize that his name was initially tied to, um, to electricity. And it's evolved through the years, but that name held sway, and it still holds sway in a, in a certain way. Yeah, that, that, that's really good stuff. Why don't I ask you, you mentioned building a moat, so it's about protecting your clients, protecting your secret sauce, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Where does the concept of premium pricing come into the equation in leveraging the brand, if at all? Because not every brand is going to necessarily command a premium price, certainly luxury brands, you think about that. But can you talk about the pricing component? L luxury brands certainly obviously can go ahead and, and charge a premium for it. Um, it's, it's also, you, you have to balance your pricing, not just on the, the product that you're offering, but where does it fit within the marketplace? What is, what is the segment of the market that you're trying to enter into? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be a premium price. You could believe that you've got the better product that you can sell at a smaller price that can gobble up a, gr a greater size in the marketplace. And you're still making a good um, margin on what the product is. And your goal is, I'm going to gobble up more geography and more market space than I'm going to have a small sliver of it at a premium price. And so it really is, where do you see your product fitting into the market segment that you want to enter into? Yeah, and that's probably a real good segue into whether it's from the marketing perspective or the legal perspective, and maybe you'll marry both here, but what kinds of research should companies be doing before they embark on a brand uh, selection process, if you will? Um, I think that from a legal side, the, the process is relatively straightforward. You're performing clearance searches, you're performing trademark searches. Um, the, the extent and the depth of what you want to embark in from the legal side depends a lot on how important this particular product or this particular mark is going to be for you. If this is the penultimate brand, if you're going to be venturing into many, many geographic markets, if you think that this has legs to go international because we are in a global marketplace and it's really easy to sell internationally now. Now you have to start to think about a, a more broader search. If this is a seasonal product, if this is a sub-brand that isn't necessarily going to be a, a regular product for you that you're going to be offering, um, or it's, we're going to have it for a couple of months, we're going to run a special on it. Um, or if it's an ad or a tagline, we're just going to run it for a, a little bit. You may want to go ahead and do something a little bit smaller, a little bit more finite, and not really think about be going beyond it and registering it. So okay. it's Sean, understanding where you want to be. Yeah. Where can folks uh, find you if they want to reach out and chat with you, Sean? Uh, I'm at uh, pepperlaw.com, which is uh, our main website, and we're also on LinkedIn. Okay. So that's Sean McConnell on LinkedIn. Yes. Awesome. Uh, we only have like maybe two minutes or so to okay. go in the program because time does fly does here. Fly. But I want to spend just a quick minute here talking to um, the smaller companies that are watching and listening. Mm -hmm. uh, in your experience, is there a thing or two or five that you could rattle off perhaps that they should be mindful of, recognizing that they may not have the same runway that a larger company has as they're experimenting with brand development? First, I, I think the, the important factor to think about here is the, a lot of these smaller companies are the companies that are driving a lot of the ideas that are making this country move forward. They're yeah, the coming innovators. up, they're the innovators, they're the entrepreneurs, and I really, truly enjoy working with them. Um, the challenge that they have is if they, if they choose the wrong path or they, they select an idea and they run with it, and they haven't taken the time to think it through, perhaps clear it, and make sure that their path forward is not going to be without any major hurdles, they can run into challenges down the road. A larger brand or someone with senior rights comes in and says, hey, we're going to need you to go ahead and change. We're going to need you to stop using that. And that, for a larger company, that might be a little easier because they've got the resources to do it, but a smaller company might not have the marketing dollars 
to do a full pivot um, or to do a pivot in enough time to salvage the product before the market doesn't want it anymore. Um, and, and so not only are you worrying about dollars, but you're also worrying about the time invested. And those are precious resources, I, and I would argue more precious resources to the entrepreneur and to the early stage company than it is to a, a more established company. Yeah, no question. So get it right out of the gate. Get it right out of the gate. Good. And that's a great spot to end, unfortunately. We're out of time. So I want to thank my guest, Sean McConnell, today to talk with us about brand development and brand protection. My name is Dave Bookbinder. If you'd like to learn more about me, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you've liked what you've heard or watched here today, please be sure to hit the subscribe button on whatever method you're watching or listening to right now. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will catch you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care, everybody.